occasion of the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, took the opportunity to urge governments, organizations, and individuals to re-educate themselves to making the achievements of peace the center point of our lives. Despite the great developments that took place, he states, in the 20th, 20th century, it was an era of violence where some 200 million people were killed, including the horrific use of nuclear weapons. And now, in our increasingly interdependent world, we have a chance to make this a more peaceful century. When conflicts arise, they should be settled through dialogue, not the use of force. We need to eliminate the threat of nuclear weapons, with the ultimate aim of a demilitarized world. War means killing. Violence leads to counterviolence. We need to put an end to combat and the production of weapons and construct a more peaceful world. With his prayers, he compels each human being to address the problems of today's world. And as long as we can continue to address our negative emotions, in his view, we fellow beings um, can recognize the oneness of humanity and understand that we will not achieve peace merely through prayer, but through action. Thanks, Mary, for inviting me to speak today. I really appreciate it. I wanted to talk to all of you about my journey into the world of peace uh, activists, I guess you could call me, and uh, ho hopefully encourage all of you to join me. So about eight years ago, uh, like so many of us, I was really getting fed up with what was going on in my own country in the USA uh, with the school violence and just, just violence in general. And I, I was wondering, like, when are they going to do something? And we were all talking about it at a dinner party. Like, well, when are they going to, when are they going to act? Why, why does the same thing happen over and over again? And then I, I kind of had this light bulb moment where I thought, well, maybe it's not they, maybe it's we. And maybe each of us can take a role in figuring out how to arm our children with the, the knowledge and the skills that they need to make a more peaceful world going forward. So with that in mind, uh, I'm a lifelong creative person. I've worked in animation and publishing and done all kinds of creative things. So I thought, well, I'm going to try to connect them all through the arts somehow. And when I posted this idea on Facebook, uh, a friend of mine that was at the time the head of the uh, United Nations International Day of Peace wrote back, well, why don't you create a project for us? So I'm gonna show you some slides and, uh, and you can see where it, where it all went. So with the encouragement of the International Day of Peace team at the UN, I started thinking about projects that could welcome every child in the world. Um, it wasn't an easy task because a lot of kids couldn't, uh, couldn't participate if it required a lot of equipment or, or anything too complicated. So, with that in mind, I decided, well, at least everybody could get a piece of paper or we could, we could supply paper if need be. So I, I decided to invite every child in the world to fold an origami crane and write a message on its wings to another child somewhere in the world. And then they could trade those cranes through a website I would set up. Um, and for years, I, I actually connected everyone by hand. It's now automated, but that's how I started was inviting them to connect through cranes, and I launched the Peace Crane Project. 
So that very first year, and at the dinner party, in fact, that we were discussing what to do about violence, um, a friend of mine, Rubia Braun, was at the party, and she was on a trip around the world, and she uh, offered to make me a video to help me launch. So she made this One, video. One, two, three. <laughs> Every year, people all around the world celebrate International Day of Peace. We all join in. It's easy and fun. Much to my surprise, that very few first year, students from all over the world began to join us. Uh, at this point, we've had over 2 million kids uh, in 154 countries participating. And at some point, we made this little video to celebrate some of those students. Welcome to the Peace Ukraine Project. So soon after starting the Peace Crane Project, teachers started mentioning to me Sarako Sazaki and her quest to fold a thousand cranes. I had never heard of Sarako. Took me on a, a global adventure, attempting to meet her brother who was still alive, was also a victim of the bombing. And he and I met uh, finally a few years ago and decided to write a book together. So I hope that each of you will, will seek it out at some point. It, it is written for ages 10 and up. It's a difficult story, but a perfect introduction to World War II and uh, a reminder of how war not only impacts uh, countries, but it impacts people and innocent people and that there are really no winners in war um, and, and that, that we, we all lose something once the war begins. So as of now, over 2 million children have participated in 154 countries. Uh, it's really remarkable to me, it's still shocking that this happened, uh, but, but they've learned uh, geography, they've connected with one another. So they've learned about each other's cultures, 
they've practiced their handwriting, they've heard other languages, they've learned to make videos of themselves, they can read a map. Uh, the teachers have also connected. And so I've, I've discovered that many of them have many uh, running long years of, of friendship and participation with their classes change, but the teachers, they, they keep their connections. So they've started new projects without me uh, based on their friendships that have developed through the Peace Crane Project. And the kids, I think most importantly, while I had sort of dreamed of them connecting and getting all these other benefits from, from the project, the one thing I hear over and over from the kids is that they feel very empowered. And I think that the, the next generation, we really do need to empower them. We don't need to teach them what to think. We need to teach them how to think and we need to arm them with the knowledge of how the world works and how we're all the same, really, uh, despite our differences. So uh, I hope that you all will take this as an inspiration to come up with your own idea. It's really uh, within your reach, I'm certain of it. And I hope you'll also uh, think about signing up your students and have them join us at peacecreamproject.org. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's so important to be in practice in our meditative state. We know this for our own survival, for our own inner peace, for our ability to deal with life challenges. But there's another reason that this is very important to work on ourselves, to, be, to cultivate the space of peace within. And that's because the collective consciousness of peace is what's going to change the planet. Right now, the collective consciousness is in fear and anger and emotional conflict. And so what else can you expect? If a huge percentage of the vibration on the planet is anger and fear and sadness and frustration, then how are we going to change the planet? Each person that adds their piece of love, of peace, of happiness to the collective field creates the field that makes it possible to have a different consciousness and a different reality on the planet. So never underestimate your role. You may just be sitting at home doing your yoga, doing your meditation, doing your spiritual practice, washing the dishes. But if you're in peace, you're in love, you're in kindness and compassion, you are creating the new world. It's a great thing that we are gifted with this opportunity to help change the world. We may never see our names in the newspaper, but we know in the infinite consciousness, in the infinite newspaper, we all made a difference. Thank you very much. Blessings, peace, compassion, and kindness. May they rule the world. It was not really how to see my understanding is what Gandhi meant is what I'm going to talk about is that when we be the change, it means we create peace within ourselves. But increasingly at the university, their interpretation was be the change by making other people change, which completely misses the point. And so, and the, the, even their logo started to get more and more edgy. So now we have two or three years later, it's changed the status quo not by being like Gandhi, but with a big bullhorn with those little Z's coming out of it. In other words, agitate. And this is not even the worst logo. And it was interesting to see the evolution of that conference move away from the genuine message of Gandhi. Not be the change yourself, make the change happen in other people. And that's exactly what Gandhi was not saying. That was his whole point. So 
I came up with, I tried to say, how could I express this concept in a meme in, as simply as possible? And it just kind of, again, I rely on inspiration. I don't always hit a home run, but at least I'm not being egoistic. So I kind of came up with this cartoon to try to drive home the difference between self-righteousness, which is trying to make other people change. That's John Brown, you know, uh, this fiery guy who helped initiate the Civil War, you know, for a good cause, but millions of people died. And then righteous is Mother Teresa, who tries to, who is exemplifies being the change. And so the question is, what is the dynamic? How does Mother Teresa in the long run accomplish more change than John Brown? Now, I want to go very quickly to a script passage in scripture that shows how Christianity, in, at least as I, I've experienced it, tends to be like this guy, the guy, John Brown. And it has to do with this crucial verse, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all the rest shall be added. Well, most Christians, in my experience, read this and they say, seek ye God's justice. And that means you have to make God's justice happen with your iron fist, hit people over the head with God's justice. But if you go back and look at the actual Greek of the New Testament, it, does, it says the word is basileia of God. And that means reign of God. And what we translate as justice is dikaiosine, which means righteousness. And this makes all the difference in the world because righteousness is not something you create in the world. Righteousness is a virtue within your own soul. So you cannot make other people be righteous, but your primary responsibility is to be righteous. So this quintessential verse of Christianity is basically saying, first of all, seek God to reign within your soul not to rule other people and seek God's righteousness again within your soul. And then everything else will fall into place. So our first, so it gets back to the question of how should we pray? And I believe personally, this works for me, that before I pray for the world, the first thing I have to do is be sure my soul is righteous. So I have to be like the little child to enter the reign of God. The reign of God is not a place the reign of God is when God tells you what to do, and you rely like a like a, a, a happy person in God's kingdom to rely on His wisdom to teach you. So our prayer is really, God, make me a right, make me right, because there's something wrong with me, inherently. Maybe not. That's a, I don't want to make it sound too much like Saint Augustine in Original Sin, but I know that there are issues within me that have to be fixed. And that's to be a happy, good, virtuous person, which I really am in my essence. I need something outside me to fix me. So the humility of a little child is, I think, our ideal. And it's that child. If we can pray like that child, then I think we can have the most influence on the world. So why do I have to pray like a little child? Gita, this isn't my favorite, but it illustrates something very important. The Bhagavad Gita, of course, relates the war in the, the uh, Mahabharata, the larger myth. It's a section of that. What I love about, and so there's a war between these two vast armies, and they symbolize our virtues on the one hand and our vices on the other. And what really fascinates me about these pictures is not that there's a war going inside us, on inside us, which there is, but in these artistic representations, the vastness of these armies. It's, it, you never see just like five or 10 guys going at it. You see uncounted hordes. And this is the collective unconscious trying to tell us that there is a conflict going inside that's vast, it's cosmic, and we don't understand it. And so we see in the center of that picture, Krishna, or the Christ consciousness, the higher consciousness, instructing Arjuna, who's the man kneeling, that's our ego. We cannot cope with this battle unless we get higher wisdom. So it is an absolute necessity before we can try to change the world. We have to deal with these armies fighting inside of ourselves. And in order to do that, we have to humble ourselves to pray to the Christ consciousness or higher self, if you will, within us. But it requires an act of humility. So I'm going to wrap up here saying very quickly, what is a Mahatma? Mahatma is Sanskrit for great soul. I, I, so Maha means great. And Atman is soul. You put two, the two together and you get Maha Atman or great soul. Now, what's interesting is that there's not a lot of difference between this word. And these are Proto-Indo-European roots. So Maha, great, and Atman are both very related to other languages in the West. 
And in Latin, we have almost the same word, magna anima. Maha is magna, great. Anima is soul in Latin. And from that, we get the word magnanimity or magnanimous, which is a virtue with a long history in the West. Some of the great philosophers associated with this evolution are Aristotle, Cicero, and Thomas Aquinas in the Christian tradition. Well, magnanimity is not just generosity. It's a lot more than that, although today we use it in a very casual form. The magnanimity isn't just being generous. It's a wish to do great things. It's a desire. It's a belief that you can do great things. But in order to do that, you can't let your ego get inflated. The prerequisite is to have great humility. So again, we must be like the little boy praying or like Arjuna kneeling down, looking to the higher consciousness. The message I would like to convey to everybody here is that the true mark of a magnanimous person is that they have great confidence in the greatness of the soul of other people. And that to the extent that we can communicate that to other people and make them want to be Mahatmas, then we become a Mahatma. And if you think, go back to the beginning, that was what, what made Gandhi a great soul, precisely because he told us to be the change. So we revere him as a great soul because he's telling us that we have the ability to have great souls. Indeed, we have great souls. We have to seek to actualize that. So in conclusion, a Mahatma helps others to see the greatness of their own souls. And this is important in an age where all the messages we're getting are just the opposite. All the forces seeking to diminish us and make us feel bad about ourselves and make us feel powerless. Um, so so to, to kind of tie this in and go full circle with my attempt at, anyway at, at a sense of humor, peace begins with a smile. And this, uh, uh, to go back also, it's, it's a, goes back to Mother Teresa, who, picture whose smiling countenance we saw earlier. So um, this is certainly something I'm going, uh, lessons I'm going to try to uh, apply as we go into these troubled times. I suppose a corollary, I mean, as we continue with these difficult times, how easy it would be to stop smiling and so how much more valuable our simple smile because that smile is saying a lot. It's saying an infinity. It's, it's, the, it's the communication of a great soul to a great soul. Hello, I have had the wonderful privilege of working with the 13 indigenous grandmothers over about a 15 year period. And they taught me so many lessons of honoring and loving Mother Earth and appreciating Mother Earth. One of the grandmothers, Grandma Aggie from Oregon, she taught, called us all water babies because we're born, we're in water before we're born. And she said, every time you're around water, bless the water. Bless it before you get in the shower. Bless it when you're drinking. Bless the bottle of the glass that you're drinking from. Bless the oceans when you can be there to look out and take advantage of that. The other is connecting to Mother Earth every day. Go out in the lawn, put your feet in grass, put your feet in dirt or sand. No shoes with rubber underneath them. Bare feet. And if you're on concrete, that's still made out of rock and that's natural for you to connect. It's called earthing. But the natives of all the countries know, be barefoot, get out in nature. The other one that is a favorite of mine, and I've been really working on meditation for about 35 years. And that is to go in your own mind and close your eyes, go into just a deep state. We call it centering because you're going within and being quiet. You're listening to nature, listening to messages, listening to God, to spirit. And most of us, you're going to visualize a favorite scene in nature. Could be under a tree, could be the forest, by the beach. For me, for years, it was scuba diving, so I was underwater. And if you think of my favorite way to do that is going through colors of the rainbow back into nature. So visualize a red rose, a, an orange, a orange fruit, a yellow lemon, or a yellow daisy, um, green grass, blue sky, purple, things like a berry or an eggplant, and violet can often be flowers. 
and just visualize those colors to get into a center state. And if you can't go out in nature and put your feet on the grass, you can go into nature in your own mind. And if we're honoring earth, honoring mother earth, being gracious to her, taking care of her, having compassion for her because we are not treating her very well right now. Um, we're creating the pollution, we're adding too much garbage to the ocean, so we really need to go out and bless and be grateful. And if we think of every little thing we can do, I remember we recycling when it was not cool. You were weird. Um, and now, of course, everybody does it. And drink out of a glass jug, don't drink out of plastic. Just do little things in taking care of Mother Earth. When I think back to the, my times with the indigenous grandmothers, and I've been with them on the reservations, I've been in Brazil with them, I've been in Alaska, and it was just amazing because they talk about spirit and talk about Mother Earth, and they honor and recognize what we have. If you can do that in your own mind every day, you will be more at peace. If you spend 20 minutes, which is 1% of your life, every day, the other 99% will be better. So when I think of the monks out talking about peace, um, all the people that are working with um, beautiful shops that you can buy special gifts in, walking, trails, the ocean. Right now, we're at, there's different times where we can't go out and do our thing, but you can go out and touch Mother Earth in your mind or with your feet, with your hands, roll in the grass, and just really honor and take care of the beautiful life you've been given and Mother Earth giving right back to you. Thank you. I love you all. With, with all of us, we are all united, we are all in unity, and we are one. And that's where oneness comes from. Bless you. Thank you. Nice to see you all. And thank you very much for giving this opportunity. And, and you, all, you all did already a great presentation. So it's now my turn. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> so firstly, I uh, appreciate very much that we commemorate uh, the, what happened, uh, what say we remembering what happened in the Nagasaki and Hiroshima on this day, uh, tragedy that happened. It's, uh, we, have, uh, we should pray for that. Never happen like this again. And we have to see the furthermore why it happened like that because of the selfish because of the selfishness and because of the greediness and because of our hatred so that's why it happened like that and it also possible it happened again actually we can't say that now nah, like this not happening again because of the if people they control their anger and hatred if they fill up with the hatred and the anger it may happen any times it is a possible. So for that, it's uh, very important uh, to learn about the value of compassion and loving kindness. And as much as we can extend that loving kindness to all sentient beings. And it's very important to the, from kindergarten, we have to start to learn about the compassion, value of compassion and loving kindness because the compassion and loving kindness, the true sources of bring uh, peaceful, yeah, it's not come from just a prayer and a good wishes. It can't be, it can't be, uh, what's it, comes uh, like that. So for that, we have to learn about the value of compassion and loving kindness. And actually we know, uh, everyone know that the uh, compassion and loving kindness is uh, one of the good thing. But uh, most of us, it lack in the practical, uh, most of us lack in the practice. We not carry, we can't carry that message. We can't carry that practice in our day-to-day -day life. So that's why we can't control our anger. We can't control our hatred. So that's why, and always uh, the trouble, always bring a trouble because of the anger, because of the hatred. So that's why it also very much possible 
happen like that uh, what say uh, may happen like this if we can't if the people not care about if the people not uh, pay attention about the emotions the negative emotion which we call it anger and hatred and jealousy and selfishness so that's why it's very important to education of inner peace education of the inner world so it's very important to prevent prevent like this happen again so for that we, uh, it's also very important to follow the non-violence and the violence is uh, just the worst way to solve problem it is uh, not a correct way to solve any problem actually through that way the non-violence we can't solve anything at the moment temporarily we can stop something but it's not that uh what's say the good idea it's not a long-lasting solving problem. It's not the right way to solving the problem. So that's why the negotiation and the, through the dialogue, it is one of the best way to solve any problem. So that's very important. And look uh, from the point of view of the, let's say, the compassion and loving kindness and the patience. So those are the very important. Uh, so I really hope that everyone pay attention about the compassion and the uh, value of inner peace and so all those come from the through practice. It's not come from just wishes and prayers. So that's why we have to learn about the compassion and loving kindness. And through that, uh, really, we can hope that uh, can bring a peaceful, uh, peaceful world. Because of the, everyone have a same ability to do that, right? Everyone have a, uh, the, uh, what's the seed of the compassion. Everyone have that. So we all have a, that ability to change something, right? to change something. For the change something, we have to do something. If we not do anything, then we just hope changing something. It is impossible. We can't change anything. Because so the many great masters say that you can't control everything, right? The external worldly things, whatever happened around us, we can't control everything. It is beyond of our control, right? So that's why what we have to do is we have to try to control our own mind because we have a, that ability to control our mind. So for that, if we, if we can guard our mind, then we can guard everything. We can control everything. So that's why it's very much impo uh, very important to learn about and uh, uh, to study about the compassion and loving kindness. And also the His Holiness mentioned many times that the education of the emotion system is very much important start from the kindergarten. Not like that after a graduation, not like that after when you get a degree of professor and you have to learn about the compassion and loving kindness, not like that. From the starting point, we have to learn and we have to try to, uh, what's say, that practice, that uh, practice, it has to be habit of our own life. When it become a habit and it's a not that a difficult thing to carry it with us. So that's why we should try firstly, it, it become a habit for us to carry the compassion and learn about practice of compassion and loving kindness. They have a many different methods to learn about because the compassion and this loving kindness is not only the, uh, what's say, the re religious matter. It is a, some kind of universal. That is the thing, the universal thing that everyone have to learn about it. Because everyone want to bring a peaceful, right? A peaceful world. We everyone want to be happy, happy life, peaceful life. So it's without the compassion and loving kindness, we can't have a peaceful. We can't change anything. Even we hope and pray as much as we do, but we can't have a peaceful world and peaceful. So that's why it's very important to learn about the compassion and loving kindness. And through that practice, absolutely we can have a peaceful world and we can bring our own uh, what's the ultimate happiness so that's the, my hope and my pray that everyone can have a that peaceful life and change everyone can have a same ability to change the world the peaceful world so that's my hope and pray so thank you so much thank you thank you so much uh, now we are going to do the ritual prayer of compassion Buddha yeah uh, ritual prayer of compassion buddha especially for the uh what say for the non-violence non-violent and the, and who passed away during this pandemic and uh, who are suffering uh, and start in this pandemic they can overcome the this difficult situation yeah or, and also we pray for the who work for uh, in the front line the doctor and nurses he tirelessly worked for all the other benefit for other beings. So we all pray for them. 
So, and also the Compassion Buddha, it's uh, one of the great prayer and prayer for generating the compassion and loving kindness. And also it is uh, for the, what's say, the overcome suffering, uh, overcome suffering and the long life prayer. So we are going to do that and shortly. And also after that, some great aspiration prayers that some kind of dedication that all the good virtues to the all sentient beings. We are sharing them on benefit and the great virtues to say, or sharing for all the sentient beings. So that's the one of the dedication prayer. Also, we are, uh, we are do, we will do that after the, the Chandrasi Compassion Buddha's prayer. Thank you for joining on this prayer. Thank you for all. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you. Now done. We are done. The uh, compassion Buddha. <laughs> Uh, I really appreciate it. You all have done so <laughs> very much. 
and uh, it's uh, really only the uh, only the message that uh, love and kindness is very important to carry it in our daily life and we really can uh, have a hope something can change in the in the what say um, in in not a short times but we we can have a hope something can change if we can continually practice if we can continually carry the message of love and kindness compassion and as much as we can spread that message uh to everyone then really we can have a hope to something change and the world peace yeah so that's i really wish and pray for that yeah and you know the great master said that as long as this as space remain and as long as uh, sentient being remains as long as I remain and uh, in order to serve others, in order to help others. So that's the only message that as much as we can helping others. So through that way, we, we can have really uh, some kind of hope that um, bring world peace and can little change in the world, yeah.